The purpose of this recording is to tell the American people the truthful meaning of the noble Christian fraternal order, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, and to tell you why you, if you can qualify, should become a Klansman or Klanswoman. The Ku Klux Klan is a secret religious order, but it is not a clandestine organization, and it never has been. It is the prayer of every Klansman that it will not again have to become an avenging organization. But if our courts, our Congress, and our President continue to oppress the white Caucasian race, denying us those God-given rights which are not government-given rights, then we shall once again avenge these tyrannies and prove worthy of our Protestant Christian ancestors. Look at history for a moment. In 1865, the Garden of the South was turned into a desert by General Sherman's army. 10,000 homes and plantations were burned to the ground. Confederate money was worthless. Poverty was everywhere, but a brave people decided to weather the storm. It isn't taught in our schools, but every historian now knows that the Civil War was not fought over slavery of the Negro. It was fought and planned by European Jewish bankers in London, England, the Rothschilds, in fact, to gain the manufacture and control of American money, which they have to this day under the Federal Reserve banking system. Slavery was only the political excuse. Not only had most of the southern state legislatures passed resolutions condemning slavery, but hundreds of the largest slave owners had freed their slaves, even going back to Thomas Jefferson. Judah Benjamin, the second in command in the Confederacy, was an agent of the Rothschilds, as was J.P. Morgan in the North and later Jacob Schiff, and before the both of them, Alexander Hamilton, whose real name was Levin. He was the illegitimate son of a Jew who started the first bank of the United States, which was later broken up. Abraham Lincoln refused to pay these Jews the interest to finance the war. The $400 billion he printed on the credit of the American people is the only money in this country upon which we pay no interest. When Lincoln planned to ship the freed slaves back to Africa and remove the cause of the trouble, he was assassinated by these Jews, and the blame for his assassination was easily placed upon the South. John Wilkes Booth had the real name of Boothby. He was a Jew. Lincoln's whole plan is now proven history. There were no prisoners of war when General Lee surrendered. The war, terrible and bloody as it was, was fought by honorable men in both blue and gray uniforms. Two years after the war was over in 1867, Thaddeus Stevens, who certainly must be considered the vilest American who ever lived, gained control of the Congress. He refused to seat the elected senators and representatives the South had sent back to Washington, and he placed former Negro slaves in their places. This club-footed, warped-minded creature was the disgrace of the North. His mulatto mistress was the first lady of the land in Washington, both of them are buried in a common grave today in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Every white man who had fought for the Confederacy was disfranchised. Only illiterate black slaves who couldn't read or write were allowed to vote. Every state legislature, every court of law, and all police authority lay in the hands of negras and white scallywags. In South Carolina alone, the Treasury was looted by these people of over $50 million. A tax of $50 a bale was placed on cotton, which robbed the impoverished South of another $67 million. The foreclosure of homes for taxes took away three-quarters of the white man's land. And then came the arming of these completely uneducated black men, not only armed with guns, but with liquor. Overnight, imprisonment of white men and women without trial took place, and finally came the rape of fair white women by their former slaves. The bravest Southern men, led by all of the clergymen of that day, went to see General Lee. Contrast that with the traitor clergy we have today in all denominations. General Lee, too, 
knew that our government had broken faith and sent a half million federal troops plus 200,000 drunken armed Negroes here to the South. General Lee told these men that he had pledged his honor and was on parole. He told them to go and see General Nathan Bedford Forrest, and that whatever movement they adopted would have to be underground and operate in greatest secrecy. It was General Lee who suggested the name the Invisible Empire. Thus was born in Pulaski, Tennessee, the Invisible Empire of the Ku Klux Klan. It was taken strictly from the ancient tribal clans of Scotland whose descendants had settled the southern states. No cross of Jesus Christ was ever desecrated by that first clan nor by any clan ever since. Yet renegade journalists like Julian Harris, the son of Joel Chandler Harris of Uncle Remus fame, won a Pulitzer Prize by inferring that Negroes were burned on the fiery cross of the clan. And subversive traitors today, like Ralph McGill, Rastus McGill, continue the smear. But within a year, the Negro was completely disarmed. Troublemakers, both white and black, were invited to leave the South, and they left. Even mayors and military officials. The ravishers of white women, both white and black, were hanged without mercy. All were flogged for lesser offenses. The Klan restored law and order to the nation, and within two years, General Forrest ordered them disbanded. The history of the Ku Klux Klan is unparalleled. A people who were helplessly ground in the dust of defeat rose within two years to complete victory. The Klan did more than save the virtue and purity of Southern white womanhood. It saved the honor of the then disgraceful United States government. Why do you suppose it is that no meeting of clansmen or clanswomen can ever be opened until the sacred altar is prepared on which rests the Holy Bible, and only after the fiery cross is illuminated? <laughs>